thank you everyone for coming to this panel and delaying your lunch probably a little bit. So I'm going to go through each of the four panelists we have and allow them to kind of introduce themselves for a few minutes and talk about what they do. And so I'll start with Robert James, who is a MTA genius and national smart city and CVAV specialist at HNBT. Actually, I'm a chief engineer of emerging mobility with uh, HNTB Corporation. We do design uh, for a lot of public sector clients. Uh, I did win the MTA challenge last month. If you heard, uh, the New York City subway uh, really uh, put out a million dollars of funding uh, for ideas, for new creative ideas. And uh, the idea I took, I took a highway technology uh, of connected vehicle technology and applied it to the subways to be able to locate the subways more accurately uh, and to get you not only uh, areas that you would normally not be able to get GPS and other kind of location technologies, but in the tunnel environments, you could get centimeter accuracy locations with this ultra wideband technology. So, so if you've heard any of that on the news, you see this technology is catching on. We're working with this technology on several other projects as well. Uh, we're working with the tunnels and bridges in the city, uh, the airports in the city, and we actually got selected as a finalist for the NYCX uh, demonstration next week for the Climate Action Challenge uh, to use the same technology to control electric vehicle chargers and automate them uh, to come to your car through an app so, so you won't have to find an electric charging space. Uh, the actual mobile charger will come to you. Uh, so this technology is going to be key for a smart city to be able to get you the location accuracy you need. So how many of you have tried to use your phones to get an Uber or Lyft and, uh, and see that the, your location is a block off from where you actually are and, <laughs> and trying to coordinate all that information? The key to success of all, any mobile app and all those kind of applications we do in a city environment are going to be getting good locations. And right now you just can't do it with GPS because you can't see the satellites. Uh, in the tunnel environment and you know, all the other areas, you need to have additional augmentation. So this ultra-wideband on, on 6th Avenue, they deployed it on 10 blocks of 6th Avenue and was able to get centimeter accuracy location. Uh, in two hours, it took them to put up the ultra-wideband transponders on the sh existing streetlights. Uh, so it was a very easy installation and it gave them high accuracy location. And this is the core technology I think we're going to need in any smart city uh, to make this work. But not only in the cities, I see this going down all the highways as well. So thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you, Robert. So our next panelist is Ryan King. He's the co-founder and CEO of Foam Inc. Uh, hi. Uh, excited to be here as well. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Foam, uh, which is a blockchain protocol. And specifically, we're working on bringing location standards uh, to blockchain. And so Foam really has three kind of main components. Uh, one is on location and coding standards. Uh, currently, there's no way to actually speak about location inside smart contracts. So if you want to reference an IoT device or real estate or uh, uh, smart cars or something, uh, we provide look encoding standards. Uh, we're also working on uh, visual tools for front-end applications as a way to visually explore smart contracts and blockchain applications. But really, the core kind of proposition that we're working on is something called proof of location. Uh, so something uh, Robert alluded to is the GPS uh, doesn't really work well in cities. But another thing it doesn't have is no interactivity. So you can't actually speak back to the GPS and generate a proof about where you've been. So it's extremely uh, trivial to lie about your location and send it to someone else. Uh, so the GPS is accurate, but there's no uh, fraud proof aspects. And when we think about autonomous uh, marketplaces or smart contracts that may execute autonomously uh, with location inputs uh, on a blockchain, Foam would be providing these location uh, verification standards. And how we want to do that is use something called the crypto economics uh, uh, native token to the open protocol that would incentivize people to run alternative hardware uh, to have a decentralized alternative to GPS that's interactive so that you can produce what we call presence claims, a digital certificate about where you've been that's also privacy preserving and fraud proof so you can keep a log or present it to an app that you may need. Uh, we're also the founding members of a new consortium that was just announced last week called Mobi. It's a mobility consortium. Uh, we were working hard with companies like BMW, GM, and Ford to get it started. Uh, so Foam is really about uh, thinking of new ways about location verification. How can we bring a immutable blockchain and incentives to that way? And really be able to empower any industry that may use blockchain technology and then needs uh, verification services. Uh, yeah, so thanks. 
All right, thank you, Ryan. Our um, next panelist is Sebastian Schneider. He's a um, research and system scientist at Carnegie Mellon University. Hi, uh, so my interest is in uh, autonomous air vehicles, uh, how we can make them fly without GPS, avoiding obstacles, uh, and gathering uh, relevant data. So for this, so there's kind of two applications. One is this kind of urban air mobility that a lot of people are talking about is how would you actually make that work is a lot of the questions we think about. And the second part is for information gathering. Uh, we've been working for a number of years now on infrastructure inspection using flying robots and uh, continuing that work now with, uh, with uh, Shimizu to uh, basically give, um, gather high resolution 3D data images and really to be able to you know, geotag if you find defects and to, keep, and to be able to keep track of the states of these uh, structures and you, know, you need one of the challenges is you need to be able to fly these, you get a lot of viewpoints to be able to cover a structure and your flying is kind of a natural way to quickly get a lot of uh, different viewpoints. And uh, you know, one of the other problems you have is of course, uh, you know, no GPS, so we have to find ways to figure out how we actually, where we are and the models of the structure as we fly along. So, so those are the kinds of questions I'm interested in. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. So our last panelist um, is Carrie Ann Nadu, and she is founder and CEO of Open Data Nation. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so my role on the panel, it seems as though there's a theme of autonomous emerging. Um, and what we do at Open Data Nation is essentially say that it is possible to take a lot of the data that cities are producing in the city of Chicago, seven million records every single day, and develop strategies for mayors and public administrators to be proactive rather than simply reactive. So we don't have a hardware, we don't have a software, we don't have a customer adoption problem. We're not directly observing of the side of a building or a road or a pothole, but we're taking all of the data that the government creates as a process of doing business and building machine learning models that then also produce risk scores. So we call them like a FICO-like risk score for every single road segment in US cities. That score represents the probability of a traffic crash in real time. So it triangulates all that we know about the environmental conditions, whether the road is wet, whether there is congestion, whether there is potholes, the speed, the lane width, and we can keep going and giving away more and more of our IP, but I won't. Um, and essentially, why is that useful? Well, if we know why and where traffic crashes are going to happen, we can proactively send resources, both human and financial. From the city side, that means police officers, that means road re-engineering, that means education campaigns. But we can also find commercial partners, folks like insurance organizations and car sharing that have aligned interests in reducing things like traffic crashes. They don't like when their car is getting crashes because they have to pay for them. So we bring together those three players, the car sharing, the insurance, and the cities to think about how we can use these risk scores to mitigate risk and get ahead of the problem. Last year was the deadliest year on the road. 40,000 people died. It was the most number of traffic-related deaths since 2007, one of the deadliest years on the road. So we think that it's actually an imperative and growing problem that we need to address with the data that we already have. Okay, with that kind of setting the stage, we have a lot of really cool things, uh, a really cool environment where you're gonna have these high-precision GPS, so your Uber will pull up to the centimeter at where you're standing. <laughs> and we're gonna have these um, planes that are going to have this great mapping ability for the drones that are gonna deliver everything to us, and then the government is gonna consume all this data and make our lives better. Um, the one thing that I'm not hearing in all of this is all of this kind of fine-grained location data and other kind of streaming data, a lot of it comes from people that inhabit these cities or have some identifier of the people inhabiting these cities. And um, myself as a researcher, I focus a lot on kind of privacy issues and things like that. And so a lot of people are just focused on getting this technology working. And we've, we've seen this before in technology where people just simply focused on getting these platforms working 
and they kind of figured, oh, we're going to deal with the privacy ramifications later on of our platforms. And then later on comes, and we're still trying to make it work better, and we never get around to these privacy things until things start popping up into the news that kind of displease us. And so kind of with your insights, where do you see kind of the privacy component of what you're trying to build within these systems? Um, specifically, the connected vehicle technology is 15 years in the making, and IEEE has worked to develop a set of credentials uh, that any communications carried over that communication mechanism you know, goes through that credential management system. And so they spend a lot of time with cybersecurity for that standard. And that's why following a standard-based approach is a very good way to go uh, for communicating that information between the vehicle and infrastructure and between other vehicles. So security sometimes means that you can't tamper with the data or alter the data, but sometimes it doesn't mean actually protecting the privacy of the data. Because right, like our cell phones are encrypted, but we can still, right, shopping malls can install devices that can track us as we go from shop to shop and things like that. And so have you looked at these standards to see if there's actually privacy on top of that security? Yeah, they have a specific section dealing with uh, PII information, personally identifiable information, uh, that's filtered out uh, before it gets to the central location as part of the uh, connected vehicle uh, tech, you know, standards that have been based. I'll say, I'll jump in here to say security is paramount. It's the first thing we talk about a lot with customers. It's their first major concern. How do we secure our data? And increasingly, as a startup, um, it becomes somewhat prohibitive. So as much as I really care about privacy and security, we've actually modified some of our product lines to use open data, data that's already publicly available. So that if some information about you is already out on the internet, we don't have to worry as much about then sharing, repurposing, and building risk models off of that. So it is going to be an emerging issue and important for everyone to address. But if you are working with startups or thinking about working with small businesses, you might also need to create new strategies or ways in which you can accelerate the adoption of their technologies and their innovations while also respecting privacy and security. Uh, I'd say that um, user privacy is at the center of what Foam is doing with proof of location, uh, about bringing basically data sovereignty to your own location. And so if we have an alternative to GPS that's uh, privacy preserving and decentralized, the signals are free and basically uh, a public service so that you can pick them up in the same way you could as GPS. But the users have agency of when they actually want to talk back to the protocol and generate a certificate about their location. And that process is encrypted. Uh, it'll be then fraud proofed. And they can generate their own private log that is privacy preserving and use different techniques to either reveal it uh, cryptographically to one person, keep a log, or reveal it to different applications they may need. So that's really at the center of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So I think for, from a flying robot perspective, it depends a lot on the sensor modality that you have, right? And so a lot of current drones use cameras as their main sensor. And so, of course, depending on the resolution, there's privacy issues there. But uh, if you think about other modalities like LiDAR and radar, the resolution is not high enough to be able to uh, identify people as easy. Uh, and so it can actually be sometimes be an advantage to have a lower resolution sensor in these situations if you but it's very, very cool um, so I'm glad everyone has thought about privacy and security of these things <laughs> um, now we kind of have that out of the way it sounds like this is going to open up a lot of opportunities for kind of interesting applications and with most technology normally the first inclination is to kind of apply it to you know existing problems to kind of make better solutions to these existing problems but it feels like once we have some of this data once we have this high precision you know GPS these high precision mapping things this you know collection of data that we can kind of process if you kind of look into your crystal ball once we kind of have you know finished kind of improving the existing processes, do any of you kind of foresee any kind of new applications that we couldn't even dream of before we had these kinds of, you know, data and high, high precision location kind of at our fingertips? 
Yeah, uh, she had mentioned that we're doing a lot of this automated vehicle projects to actually control the vehicles. You really need that high precision accuracy to make the automation work. Uh, but also part of the MTA challenge was uh, picking up pedestrians that fall in the tracks uh, and getting that kind of high accuracy information you need to know a difference between someone standing on the platform and actually being you know, down in the tracks and you know, pick up that kind of uh, location accuracy. So there's just millions of applications that start unfolding with that high level of accuracy. Uh, and it, people just can start thinking about all the things they can do with it and the apps that they can build and all the applications that can be developed in that. And I'd say uh, with foam, it's an open protocol uh, that would be decentralized and really would only be able to be built out with the efforts of uh, others in a permissionless fashion. So we imagine most of the applications we wouldn't be able to think of ourselves. Uh, if you think uh, Twitter is most famous for the hashtag, but that was completely user generated. It wasn't something the company told people to do. Uh, but we're really also interested specifically for the sake of this conversation in the mobility use cases. And as I mentioned, we're founding members of this consortium, Mobi, uh, with those other companies uh, like BMW or GM. And they're really interested in these shared standards. So can we actually, across different fleets, uh, keep an um, uh, interoperable record uh, that in, in that way? So we're excited about those mobility applications too. So there's a lot of talk about big data and there's a lot of data being collected already or images, like if you think about what's being kept track of. But uh, to really have useful data, you need accurate location with this information, accurate tagging. So if you later come back, you can say, oh, you know, this used to look like this, now I'm coming back, it looks like that. So, so you so this is I think one of the things that's going to change a lot now it's not just a picture that you take it's a picture that's associated with a map that you can go to that you can do temporal differencing that you can you know do an, an analysis over time and I think those are the kinds of things that are going to change a lot of decision making and allow you to do also get more actionable information out of this this data I think just like I was a big general trend, I think that's definitely going to happen. Yeah, as the startup company on the panel, I have all the crazy ideas, so let's get weird. Uh, so talking to cities around the United States, we ask them this question, like, what are you going to do with all this data? Because in part, we want to help them actually solve real problems that they, that they deal with. We work with the city of Fort Lauderdale, the city of Miami, and they were recently devastated by a hurricane. And what we heard from Fort Lauderdale is, thank God we have a repository, a data set of all of our sign infrastructure because it either got ripped up or turned around in the hurricane. City of Miami said, oh shoot, we don't have a repository of all of our sign infrastructure and that stop sign that's missing, if we had an autonomous vehicle on the road, we would be knee deep in problems right now. So I think we're going to see, with a lot of the data coming out of city, seven million records in Chicago, billions of records a year, it's the most underutilized big data resource in, the commercial, in commercial industries right now. Car sharing, insurance I mentioned, loan origination from banks, you can see hedge funds getting into this data, there's a lot of data out there. What you're going to see is alignment of interests where an autonomous vehicle senses a stop sign, uses the city data to validate that stop sign as a baseline, right? They actually need that data in order to validate that what they're observing is what they're actually observing with their sensors. And then feeding that information when it's relevant back to the cities in order to make sure the stop sign that's missing gets replaced in a timely manner. Now there's plenty of other corporate interests at play here, right? An insurance carrier who's insuring those vehicles also cares that that stop sign gets replaced. And you're starting to see actually insurance carriers make infrastructure investments, putting up stoplights themselves in intersections where they know from their own claims history that there's a really bad history of traffic crashes. So I think it's hugely transformational and it starts with this alignment of interests. So I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about automation and autonomous things. But the problem is with any city is that you can't refresh the infrastructure with kind of a snap of the finger. And so we're going to have kind of this transitional period, right, where we're going to have a partial deployment and kind of, is there anything useful when we have this partial deployment or is it, are we just going to have to wait for the entire deployment to kind of reap the benefits of what we're seeing here? Yeah, there actually is several uh, areas of penetration that are feasible right now. Right now, the low-speed automated shuttles 
in a mixed you know, pedestrian and other vehicle environment is very doable, and that's being deployed in several areas around the country and around the world. Um, dedicated facilities, you know, dedicated guideways, uh, dedicated roadways can easily be automated uh, because the vehicles can talk to each other, uh, exchange information, and you've got a controlled environment. Uh, but to do the you know, full mobility on demand automation is going to take several years because there's so many special case situations uh, you know, trying to handle all those cases. A lot of the vendors are having hard times with left turns, with lane changes, you know, and those kind of things. So, so there is going to be a while before that you know, full automation happens. Definitely the question of deployment in our uh, case because we want people to be running uh, their own hardware and be their own service provider and we're interested in this low power wide area network radios, specifically one called LoRa. And if you can look, there's groups called like the Things Network where people are running these uh, as open source projects. So there's like 13 in New York, uh, Zurich, there's like over 100 of people running these radios. So we, in our protocol, we actually want to provide uh, economic incentives for people to actually uh, do this coverage in this in-between phase before there is full coverage. And how we actually solve that is through uh, incentive rewards. So if you know something like Bitcoin, people join in a decentralized way and they run the system uh, for selfish reasons because they can earn money. Uh, so in this kind of bootstrapping phase, uh, people running this time sync protocol and just simply providing uh, fraud proof location services, they can be eligible for these rewards in a way to bootstrap coverage before there is this robust new marketplace uh, to support it. So there, so we heard about basically the infrastructure dependent methods, but there are also infrastructure free methods, right? So you could think about um, some methods that use, uh, you use your imagery to locate yourself with respect to that imagery or with respect to the geometry of the of the structure, so there's a so in that sense, and they come with all their pros and cons, right? You know, infrastructure has advantages, has some overhead. You can do infrastructure free, might have less reliability, reliability potentially. So I think there's uh, you know lots of lots of ways to solve these problems. And everyone in the room here should probably be familiar with Vision Zero. It's a mayoral initiative to reduce traffic crashes to zero internationally, 40 cities in the United States. What I'll say is the mayors have interest in seeing crashes go away. They're going to have to deal with this kind of interaction, but see it as an opportunity where introducing autonomous may reduce traffic crashes, but we need to be monitoring that and making sure that it's actually achieving the goals we set out to achieve. Uh, if it's not, then we need to modify and know what the leading indicators of risk are on our roads so that we can modify to adapt and prepare for a time where it will be fully autonomous in theory. I myself have never owned a car, so I'm all for it, but uh, I, I, I also don't know that it will ever not be a mixture uh, of cars and vehicles on the road. So we just need to get to a place where we're comfortable with that. All right, um, so I've been dominating most of the questions as the moderator, but I figured I would open it up to kind of the panelists now that you've heard kind of everything that you have in the works. Do you have, do you have questions amongst each other? I would love to know, and as the autonomous vehicle folks, I'm going to steal your expertise. Uh, we hear a lot of OEMs are really focused on the sensor and the hardware technology. When do we move on to the software? And do you see that happening sooner rather than later? And what kind of softwares are you seeing early adopter, adopters take on? Um, I actually think uh, BMW is pretty progressive with what they're doing on board. I uh, actually just found out that they actually deploy ultra-wideband chips on their vehicles for the factory to be able to get accurate installation of equipment in the factory. Um, I just found out that yesterday. Uh, but also, BMW is deploying uh, their camera systems that look for their uh, parking. They're being used to send data up to the cloud for parking availability in cities. Uh, you know, so using this uh, intelligent vehicle data, opening up these applications, I think are really impressive. You know. I'm sure they appreciate the plug, too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I think, I mean, every, every big vendor, I think, has their, their software team. I mean, I mean, I don't want to give any plugs for any companies, but <laughs> there's, there's everybody has their team, and there's lots of startups to uh, uh, working on the software part, I think, yes. All right, does anyone else have kind of questions amongst each other? Okay, if not, then I might go ahead and break the third wall. I'm not sure if this is allowed or not, but I'm going to do it anyways and kind of 
now that everyone has been here for 30 minutes, kind of open it up to questions from the audience that you might have. Oh, and awesome, and we have an extra mic. So apparently this is allowed. Um, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, just a question to follow up uh, on, on that last question. Um, to what degree do you think that autonomous technology, specifically for cars, will become kind of commodified and every single OEM will be able to produce this? To what to extent do you think that this is such a hard engineering problem that it's likely only going to be solved by a few folks? I think it's going to be something like an Android, Apple kind of thing. Like you'll have a couple of things emerging that, uh, that are reliable enough and some of the other things will merge with that or go away. There's going to be a consolidation phase coming in soon. And one thing you do see is a lot of the Waymos and the Teslas are working with autonomous vehicles, but the big piece they're missing is the connected vehicle part of that. Uh, there's a lot of problems you really can't solve without that connectivity. Uh, everyone, you know, look at the tests that are being done in the country. They're being done in Florida's, Arizona's, where they don't have a thing called weather. <laughs> and if you come up north here, you know weather is an issue. So sensors only work so well. And when you start covering the road with snow and you know and uh, fog and other kinds of weather conditions, you need something that tells you where you are, regardless of what the sensors do. And camera, lidar, and even radar has problems with weather. Um, so using those technologies alone aren't going to be enough. And that's where connected vehicle technology comes in to communicate your information with all the vehicles around you and you know, through whatever weather conditions are there. It's not limited by that weather situation. I just want to say there are a couple of autonomous companies in Pittsburgh also. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, I have a question for you, Carrie Ann. In the transportation world right now, there's two very large sets of possible data. Traffic signal system data, number of vehicles, they turn left, they go straight, they turn right, or on a freeway, volume on the roadway and so forth. In the type of work that you do, are you able to possibly predict the higher potential for accidents on highways, are you able to work with signal system data and maybe make recommendations for traffic signal retimings? Can, can you talk to something like, and if you don't do it now, is it all feasible? Yeah, so we build, anytime we build a model, we're actually building two models, a traffic count estimation methodology, and then an ex, so an exposure model, how many cars are on the road. If there's zero cars on the road, mm -hmm. you're bound by a likelihood of traffic crash of zero on the lower end. You can't have a crash without a car there. Um, so all of our models, we need to work with city administrative data coming off of street lights and other count methodologies. What we're seeing is a great opportunity as they're further integrated into street lights to improve the, the confidence levels of those predictions. Right now, many cities go out there with a clicker and they're counting cars as they pass by. Um, so while we have a baseline with the data that's available, will absolutely be improved over time. In terms of the engineering that can come from it, we actually partner with civil engineering firms. We're, our specialty is in city planning and statistics, which is a weird mix, uh, I'll admit. I'm a bit of a unicorn. But uh, we lean heavily on civil engineers that have had traditions and histories of understanding once we know the problem, where it is, its severity, and we can isolate its importance on, say, traffic crash bad outcomes, we can design solutions to it. Where we focus on, in on is when, where, and what are we going to do in those intersections, and then leave it to our, our very qualified counterparts and civil engineering firms to design the interventions. Hi. Uh, let me, as quickly as I can, articulate my big concern. As a matter of fact, so big I'm writing a book, a book about it. Um, I come out of the municipal finance and credit sector. And my big worry with transportation as a service or mobility service specifically is the wrenching disruptive changes that are inevitably going to occur, occur in demographics, in um, number of cars manufactured, in the whole revenue infrastructure of governments 
as disruptive change occurs. And I see at least one panelist nodding her head, and her gives you a clue as to who it is. Um, but how do we get through the disruption to the other to the other side um, while losing taxes, l losing revenues to the sharing economy, uh, seeing really disruptive changes in where economic activity and how economic activity occurs? I guess that one's for me too. Um, so absolutely, it's going to transform the way we get sales tax revenue if people are buying less cars, selling less cars. Um, it's going to transform the way that we generate revenue from our public and oil, great point. Uh, from our public infrastructure as well and use of public transit, absolutely. And this is why I stress the alignment of interests. Unfortunately, where we're at today is these big companies are coming in and setting the rules for cities. Uh, we saw that with Uber and I think a lot of people are becoming more aware of the downside. However, we have other major corporations coming in and offering for free a lot of infrastructure, a lot of um, disruptive technologies to use your words so I think in order to prepare for it the first thing cities need to do is say for themselves what are we going to get out of this are we going to achieve better health and safety are we going to reduce crashes what are the goals that we want to see and metrics we want to achieve with those partnerships and not just allow these companies to come in and run run roughshod um, introducing these new technologies without seeing some return and I think you're right, the, especially the public sector is having a hard time keeping up uh, with the demand that these uh, Ubers and Lyfts you know, generate. Uh, the airports having curb space enough to handle the massive amounts of Ubers and Lyfts dropping people off. Uh, you know, just the public. And, mm -hmm. Exactly, you know, a lot of the revenue from the airports come from their parking. Uh, and so if they're losing part of that, the one thing that has to be a focus is that uh, public transit uh, uh, gains a lot of public sector uh, funding, you know, from more than half their operational costs usually are from the uh, public taxes. So uh, really trying to encourage ride sharing through these first last mile trips that Ubers and Lyfts are doing, the only way that can happen is if there's federal subsidies for those first last mile trips. But they have to deal with the social equity issues um, so if you look, I did an article in Metro Magazine this month that talks how to handle uh, the funding for those uh, first last mile trips and have them qualify for federal subsidy. Uh, so that's going to be an important part and to encourage the ride sharing that comes with that. This question is uh, for Ryan. Um, so I, w I was curious, how, what kind of challenges you're facing in terms of implementing this on a global basis? Are there different regions or different parts of the world that are easier or, or different? To, to kind of implement uh, the solution. And then the second question is, um, how are you ensuring that there's, there isn't um, too much concentration um, on the, the radio beacons? Yeah, so we haven't actually launched yet. Uh, and when we are launching, uh, it won't be with this, what we call dynamic proof of location with deployed hardware. It'll be on uh, curating points of interest uh, on the map. Uh, like static proof of location in a, uh, in a way to curate to with tokens and vote in that manner. But when we do launch, uh, where it will start will be based on where people want to participate. Um, so that will be community driven. You can see on our blog we have like a proto heat map of where users put where they want to run these nodes. So that's exciting to see. But once it actually starts and you have this like de density problem, uh, how do you actually then get coverage to expand is where we're uh, innovating in economics. So we have this uh, idea called signaling where you can uh, basically lock up tokens on the map in a location to show that there's demand there. And the block rewards, when the mining rewards happen, are spatially weighted so that uh, where there's a signal, even if there's no zone of coverage, uh, you would be incentivized to go there to set it up because you could get a higher reward even if there are no customers. And that would then be a fluid process where over time uh, the amount of tokens being given out would decrease as coverage increases and it would always be more profitable to potentially open a new location. So. That's how we see it uh, developing, but it would all be user-driven in a permissionless kind of grassroots way of people deciding to set it up and run it. All right, have we, anyone else in the audience have questions? Okay, then I guess 
Wait. Oh. Sure. Keep them coming. <laughs> Uh, to, to what extent do you think cities with the rise of autonomous vehicles will be forced into schemes like congestion pricing or curbside pricing in order to combat some of the missing revenue that we hear about from other sources? Yeah, that's definitely going to be an issue, not so much with the automated vehicles, but especially with electric vehicles. Uh, at the previous session, they talked about the loss of the gas tax. Uh, that has been a source of revenue uh, when you go to a lot of these electric vehicles. And, and of course, the automated vehicles are all being designed electric as well. Um, so your vehicle miles traveled, uh, a lot of different agencies are exploring ways to, uh, to do that. Uh, with this connected vehicle technology, it gives you a way to deploy congested pricing uh, capabilities with this technology uh, to be able to manage uh, that kind of use of, the, of your public roadways. So I think, um, chime in on that, the UK has actually implemented this in some zones like London and places like that. How do you see it working out for them when they've deployed it? Um, I think, you know, we've seen some positive results and some negative results for the, you know, vehicle miles traveled. In some ways, New York already does that for the tolls coming in the city and, you know, being able to manage that and the cost of doing that. Uh, but the new technologies, the open road tolling we're working on for the tunnels and bridges to allow you not to have to stop for those tollings uh, will become much more uh, pervasive and, and spread you know, across the country. And it, the easier it is to put up those facilities, then you're going to see more of the congestive pricing kind of implementations. How are you doing? Uh, David Pickerel from the Business Council for International Understanding. Uh, quick question. I mean, all this technology is obviously great. It's being deployed. Uh, but for all the panelists, how do we ensure that as we employ this technology that essentially no one is left behind, that there's an element of enablement and empowerment that comes to all citizens, not just the highly technically connected within a city or anywhere else? I'll tackle that one uh, to start. So we work with a lot of Vision Zero cities, 26 Vision Zero cities across the United States from Anchorage, Alaska to Miami, Florida. Recently wrote a report about how they're transitioning to become much more technologically sophisticated. And I left out one word, and that was equity. And every single city wrote back and said, it is vitally important that you include an entire section of this report on equity. Where I'm from in the District of Columbia, black and brown people are seven times more likely to be hit and killed by a vehicle. That's a statistic that the Department of Transportation says publicly. I am not revealing any new information there. They know they have a problem, and I do believe they're actually very forward in, in telling people about the problem in order to essentially look for solutions. Um, Vision Zero, that's part of their, their mission, is to reduce traffic crashes and frankly, if they target folks who are underserved, uh, underrepresented, and minorities who live in low-income communities, they're going to get the biggest bang for their buck. They're going to prevent more crashes and save more lives by focusing on those communities, and they know it. Yeah. Ideally, it would be great for the public agencies to you know, be out in front of this. Uh, but an example with the connected vehicle technology, there was a notice of proposed rulemaking that came out two years ago to require all vehicles to have the connected technology on board. Uh, the new administration came in, and that kind of slowed down, and no one did anything with it. But now uh, Toyota just announced they're going to have all their new vehicles equipped by 2021, and GM is going to come out with the same announcement very shortly as well. So. Uh, so this is you know, something that's going to happen re regardless of whether the government is out, out in front of it uh, because people realize the need for it. Uh, but I'm trying to encourage everyone to keep it as standards-based approaches instead of uh, having everyone with their own standard. You know, I mean, eventually you might have an 800-pound gorilla that wins over an industry-based standard, but it would be better if they use uh, an IEEE or SAE standard that gets established. Okay, I'll go ahead and toss out one more question. So we've been talking a lot about vehicles that, you know, go along the ground. And these we're, we're fairly comfortable with and familiar with. But right as we start to get these things and we have all these proposals of drones and things like this, what do these drones kind of open up in terms of challenges? So I think, I mean, safety is, a, you know, of course, the m main challenge I think that I see. I mean, there's a lot of challenges of just getting them flying and energy density and noise and so, so there's lots of challenges 
uh, but uh, especially in the urban areas, also safety is a big challenge. You know, if something uh, goes wrong, what do you do? You know, how do you minimize uh, the impact? And uh, and it's 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 uh, the same trade-offs and 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 difficult decisions you have to make with autonomous driving. Or do you do you stop? Uh, you know, do you injure the people on board? while not hitting somebody that's crossing the street kind of questions. Uh, and so, so, uh, so these are difficult decisions if you think about that these things will fly autonomously and have to make these, uh, these uh, difficult emergency decisions. And it's not something that is easily pre-programmed. Right? They'll have to react in real time, make these decisions. So, so those are some of the challenges we, we look at. But of course, just on the vehicle side itself, there's lots of challenges in terms of your battery density, uh, rotor noise, traffic density. If you think about it, you'd have, you would want to have these hubs of vehicles coming in and going. It's much denser than uh, really a human pilot would be able to handle. So there's a lot of coordination that would need to happen. So there's lots of interesting challenges. Yeah. So I guess also to bring up the privacy angle a little bit, um, one thing that I experienced was I went to like a World Series baseball game. Admittedly, it was in San Francisco, but I was struck by the number of drones. There was like I was counting them, and I lost count after like 30 or 40 drones that were just hovering somewhere around the stadium. And presumably, a lot of them had cameras, and they were streaming back some communication of the game based on where the drones were positioned. And so, how are we gonna? deal with these privacy issues, not just at baseball games where right, companies are paying lots of money to get exclusive rights to stream these games, but when you can have these drones that just are anywhere and can right, stream things from people's houses and things like this, how are we going to deal with I mean, that kind of I, world? I think, it's, I think cell phones are a bigger privacy issue than drones. I mean, drones look scary, but uh, well, I don't know, maybe you have this buzzing thing, right? But so you need to have enough resolution for it to become an issue, right? So I'd, I don't know, I'd say maybe 20 by 20 pixels to be able to identify a face, right? Maybe you can get away with a little more with a person to track them. So you'd have to be quite close to get enough resolution. So I think that you know, these are the kinds of analysis, but I think your cell phone, you know, AT&T or T-Mobile knows where you are at all times, right? Okay, I think we're basically out of time. Is there one more? Okay, one more question. All right, all right yeah. Um, Rethink X, which has done an awful lot of work on transportation as a service, that I'm sure some of you know, or maybe all of you know, um, talks about um, ubiquitous uh, automated electric vehicles in the early 2020s and then a 10-year transition to dominance of shared vehicles, uh, mostly uh, mostly electric. From that point, any comments on timing and h how overly optimistic they might be? Uh, well, I'd say full mobility on demand is probably a little bit too optimistic. Uh, like I said, you can do slow speed shuttle kind of operations within a you know, within a region right now, but to do go anywhere in the city you want to go point to point is going to be five plus or more years before something like that happens. I'll jump in and say I think an aggressive timeline has another benefit, which is it's like the cancer moonshot or going to the moon. It motivates people to be entrepreneurial and to get excited and interested in solving this problem. I, and the long and short of things, my lifetime is just a blip, right? My dad used to say it's a pee hole in the snow, so you know I'm from New England, right? It's nothing. So if it's five years, if it's 10 years, if it's 150 years before we see autonomous vehicles on the road, I think the aggressiveness of the timeline is really just to motivate people um, and see some really cool technologies come out sooner rather than later. Okay, with that, thank you very much for attending this panel.